you were talking about how going out and preaching was confrontation. Uh, I thought that was a good line of, uh, of um, thought. Maybe we could explore it some more. Um, <coughs> First the tapasya, then the bliss. Yeah. In other words, say you go through Prabhupada's Gita, and if you went line by line in his purports, and you analyzed each sentence on this basis, the analysis would be how many of the sentences are neutral? They give knowledge, transcendental information. How many of the sentences are negative, quote unquote? He's criticizing something, he's exposing something, he's condemning something. And how many of the sentences are quote unquote positive? Now we know from the from the absolute perspective, that every single sentence would fall under the category of being absolute positive. But I'm talking here in regard to, on the relative plane, how they, how a person would say that is a negative sentence, that is a positive sentence, that is a neutral sentence. Right. So that intelligence or that analysis is not entirely uh, to be ignored. It's there. You would find more negative than positive. You would find more criticism, more judgmentalism, quote unquote, more confrontation, more condemnation. So why is that? For example, how many of us, you and I have talked about this previously, how many of us even heard of a Mayavadi or the philosophy of Mayavadi before we became devotees? Would you say even one in a hundred? If yeah. we take the non-Indian. Yeah, easy. Less than one in a hundred or one in a hundred. But right from the gate, Mayavadi. All, in so many of Prabhupada's purports, in so many of his lectures, morning walks, why is that? Because it's going to have to be confronted up the road mm. by everybody, by all these new devotees. They don't know it, but on a very subtle platform, Mayavad's already present in them. Mm. So you would go out in the beginning and if you take the attitude that I will attract members to our movement, to our temple, to our Sankirtan party, I will do that through attracting them. All right. That's a nice tactic. And it can be effective. But is that really what needs to be done in the beginning? Are you going to attract people who are looking for sense gratification by offering a so-called better sense gratification? When the whole purpose of all yoga systems is Navritti Marg. Pravritti Marg can be interpreted in two ways, both the same ultimately. Namely, Pravritti Marg in its real sense, the term Vedic, is to follow the Karmakanda, to worship the demigods, recognizing Vishnu, recognizing the supreme demigod, the Parameshwar, and perform the yagyas to the demigods as agents, but perform the demigods' sacrifices to them in order to please them and then to get material rewards from them. It's, it's almost entirely activity in the mode of goodness, although there is some passion there. It certainly is not activity in the mode of ignorance. Mm. That's one definition of Pravritti Marg. That, that's, the, that's the Vedic narrow definition of Pravritti Marg. The expansive definition of Pravritti Marg is all endeavor in the material world to try to get things of this world, to try to get uh, happiness from this world, to try to aggrandize within this world, to enjoy sense gratification in this world, to enjoy honor, 
to enjoy profit, adoration, and distinction, to have something where you've accomplished something in this world. That's, that's the expansive Pravritti Marg. Of course, all of that Pravritti Marg in the context of Kali Yuga means that you get tremendous, you're, you're burdening yourself with tremendous amount of vik karma or negative karma, so that then at the time of death, you've lost eligibility to remain human. Because mm. that's what the animals are doing. Everybody is trying to not only survive, survival is, of course, ultra important, but also to, quote unquote, th thrive, quote unquote, enjoy, sense gratification, etc. So, if the goal of bringing devotees into the movement is to attract them, well, what are they going to be attracted by? They're not going to be attracted by the pastimes of the Supreme Lord in the spiritual world, with, the, with rare exceptions, they're not going to be attracted by, by that. So first, it has to be peeled away all the covering, or at least as much as possible. Mm. And that's done through confrontation, by saying, have you really thought about it, that all it, what you're doing is going to culminate in death, so therefore is there really any value in what you're doing. So if the comebacker is, uh, well, you say you transcend death. How is that? You're going to die, I'm going to die. How do you transcend death? Well, you don't know the art of dying then. You don't know how to transcend death. You can take a cheap attitude about it and say that oh, God will protect you, etc. But how is that being proven in your life anyway? There is a secret to the art of dying. There is a way to transcend death. You have to know what it is. And how do you know? Through practical realization. How do you know something sweet? When you taste it and the sweet is right there, and you say, well, that's sweet. Mm. So if you've actually transcended death, then that means, what does it mean? Janma karma chame divyam evan yoveti tatputaha tatvyang dehang punar janma naitiman eti sarjana. You have the transcendental pastimes of the Lord playing in your mind like watching a television, the transcendental TV. And that's not awarded easily. That's awarded after thousands and thousands of yagyas that actually please the Supreme Lord. And that's why I say, first comes the tapasya, then the bliss. Mm -hmm. Tapasya means voluntary acceptance of pain for the purpose of self-realization. Voluntary acceptance of authorized pain, not concocted, but authorized. That taking on this pain, penance and austerity. Penance and austerity. Austerity means you have an opportunity to enjoy something. Oh, very easy to take it. It's right there. And you don't. That's called being austere. And penance means you take on unnecessary suffering that you don't need to take on, but you take it on because it helps you advance in spiritual life. That's tapasya. These terms, penance and austerity, they can apply materially, but then they're not called tapasya. Tapa means to burn. Mm. Just like uh, I've experienced this in the cold water. Uh, if you take a, a cold shower under the cistern with the temperature at 33 degrees or something, and the cold water hits you, if you really analyze the pain that you're undergoing, it's almost, this seems contradictory, but if you really analyze it, it's like it's burning also. Mm -hmm. And we all know about what's called hot ice, so that it actually burns, but it works like ice. The, so pain, tapa, means... It burns. You can't totally be comfortable in the material world for very long. You can maybe for an hour or two be comfortable. Uh, and you have to spend all kinds of money, time, energy, and be really fussy about it. And then your, your physical body's comfortable for a short time. And then you're a little too cold, a little too hot, mm. a little too hungry. Whatever it might be, it breaks down. Whatever it might be, it breaks down. But all these efforts to have constant comfort 
are all sense gratification that is futile because the senses are past networks leading to death. Because at death, if you aren't prepared for death by being jnana vigyana astikyam, by being following the Vedic truths with knowledge and realization, you get detachment. Jnana vairagya. And that vairagya means you're just not attached to the comfort of the body because you know it's a futile attempt anyway to get it permanently. You can never get it permanently. Impossible. You only get it for a short time with all kinds of great uh, sacrifices and inconveniences put up beforehand to get to that, and then it's spent, and then you got to do it again. Mm -hmm. My point is that we've lost the thread. We've lost where we really came from. You attract devotees through jnana vairagya. You attract devotees through tapasya. You attract devotees by pointing out that what illusions you're in in regard to enjoying the material world. You don't know what the repercussions are. What's happening here? It's just like we're sitting here at these 17 acres. All right. And mostly it's woods, but actually it's billions of different living entities in the forms of insects, worms, uh, trees. When you see a deer come by, which on a daily basis you do, they're the advanced ones. The... Out of the billions of living entities, those deer are the advanced ones. And they're animals, they have no ability to be Krishna conscious. They have no ability to be introspective. They can't analyze their situation and say, why am I here? Every real devotee, and we can even say of those who have become sahajas, which is a great many, but we can say in the beginning they were real devotees until they became sahajas down the line. Every real devotee, either just before becoming a devotee or right at the point of being preached to and getting the realization, came to the big question. And what is the big question? The big question is, why am I here? Why am I forced to suffer? Why? There must be a reason. And that answer is given in Krishna consciousness. So if we're going to attract devotees, we have to get back to where we came from, to our real roots. We attracted through confrontation. We attracted through quote-unquote negativity. <laughs> not that we are masochists. We are not masochists. We're against masochism. We're against sadism. A devotee is not a sadist. A devotee is a friend to all of the entities. When I was coming down to pick you up, I was coming at 60 miles an hour on those winding roads on Highway 7 there. I went over a turtle. I didn't run him over. He went underneath. I went past by about 100 yards. I said, wait a minute. Somebody's going to hit that turtle. I stopped, backed up, went and put him in the grass. Because you want, a devotee doesn't like any, any living entities to suffer. Vaishnav means you don't want a living entity to suffer. You want a living entity to not suffer. You want to relieve suffering. You don't, a devotee is displeased when another living entity suffers. However, when you help another living entity come to knowledge, by living entity here we mean a human, because the animals can't do it, and the lower than the animals, they can't do it. You're not going to go successfully preach to a crocodile. You can successfully enlighten and help another human being. But even the vast majority of them in this age you can't help because they're such, they've lost the power. They've lost the power to even comprehend. They can't comprehend anymore. But some can. And therefore, how do you do it? You confront. And we've lost that confrontational spirit. Hmm. That confrontational spirit was there. Wouldn't you agree in the beginning? Definitely. Yes. When devotees came in the beginning, the idea was, Prabhupada said, yagya, tapasya. And that's confronting your own self, because your own self doesn't want that. Your own self doesn't want that discomfort. But you go in and you confront and you say, Guru says, I don't want it, but Guru says, I want it. Because Guru says, you confront yourself. Because the program you had been doing for the previous 20 years, that didn't work. That didn't give you the pastimes of the Lord in your consciousness. Hmm. Neither did that make you materially successful. Instead, you were being harassed by more and more psychological problems, more and more difficulties, 
diminution of opportunities in the material world. So what do you say to someone who says, well, Prabhupada wants us to have nice feasts, nice yes, programs? Well, it's, it's a combination. In other words, you also attract in that way. Prasadam means mercy. So really, in all the other yoga systems except this yoga system, which is the highest one, Bhakti is the highest one, Buddha yoga, Bhakti yoga, is the highest yoga system. Although the jnanis, they don't say like that. But they may not say like that, but it still is, because Bhagavad Gita says it is. So in this system, you can have some prasadam. You can actually, in certain ways, enjoy some sense gratification that's been transcendentally surcharged, that's not allowed in the other yoga systems. In all the other genuine yoga systems, be it jnana yoga, or particularly ashtanga yoga, it is tremendous pain, tremendous denial, tremendous austerity. But in this, in this yoga system, you can have a little, as long as it's authorized in the line from the parampara, the guru parampara. So that can be to help that, for example, say you do in the old days, I don't know if this is being done anymore too much, but in the, back in the day, late 60s, early 70s, even you can say to some degree mid-70s. You put in really hard eight, nine hours uh, doing magazines or books or Sankirtan on the street, whatever it is. And then you get to come back in the, in the early evening or late afternoon to have some really tremendous prasadam. So on the on the trip, uh, on the Sankatan van coming back, you feel real good. You have so much bliss flowing because of your tapasya. First the tapasya, then the bliss. Then you get another reward of a little sense gratification that's authorized. It didn't degrade. It didn't make you more absorbed in comfort. Right. It made you more absorbed in Krishna consciousness. Right. Because it was Krishna prasadam. Right. It's prasadam, mercy. But you didn't come back and have sexual intercourse with a new female that just came in to the cult. That was not. You could not have that sense gratification. That would degrade you right down even lower than you were before by far. Because it's unauthorized. Because the whole principle is that to the degree that we are absorbed in the, in the physical body, then we must take another physical body in accordance with what has happened to our astral body in the course of that absorption. The fact is, just like that pulp inside the coconut has to get totally detached, we're covered by sheaths, anamaya kosha, pranamaya kosha, manamaya kosha, even the vijnanamaya kosha is a sheath ultimately, very, very high sheath, but it's still it's still part of conditioned life. It's not what you have in the spiritual sky. We have to get free of these sheaths. The Anamaya Kosha is earth, water, and fire. Everybody can see fire. Everybody can taste water. Everybody can smell earth. Everybody knows these, these qualities. That's the physical body, Ana, food. You have to eat in order to keep the physical body functioning. Then subtler than that is the Pranamaya. Prana, of course, the air, which travels in your body, ten different life airs, prana being the main one of the ten. And included in that kosha is ether, which is still called uh, panchamahahuta, one of the five gross elements. So the ether is the carrying of the sound. And that's in the body, because otherwise you slap how there cannot be ether. There's sound coming from your clapping of your hands. Sound mm. is coming out. So there mm. has to be some sound in. Just like if you burn wood, you get fire because there's some fire in it. But if you burn a rock, you don't get fire because fire isn't in a rock. So the pranamaya kosha is more subtle than the manamaya kosha more subtle. That's mind, false ego, mundane intelligence, material intelligence, false ego, mundane intelligence, material intelligence. 
that's even more subtle than the ether and the air, uh, manamaya kosha. Then vigyanamaya kosha, that's Brahman realization. But in the spiritual sky where we came from, we didn't have that as our constant consciousness. That's still part of the covering having come down. Hmm. Vigyanamaya kosha. That's the goal of realization of the Mayavadis, who Prabhupada constantly confronted in his writings, in his lectures, in his morning walks, in his room conversations. He constantly confronted the Mayavadis. So Prabhupada set the standard. He was very mm. quote unquote negative. He was very quote unquote confrontational, but he set the standard. That's great. That's great. I still don't know if I'm recording this properly, so uh, well, I, mean, I don't know. I don't know if we got the right lighting. We could. Sit. Siddhya Siddhyo Samogutva Samatvam Yoga Uchite, you know that one? What does it mean? It means whether you succeed or fail, ah. Samatvam, Sama, keep the same equanimity yeah. of mind. Yeah. Because the endeavor is to please, you're going to get the result that matters anyway. Now, if you get the result on the material plane, well, all well and good, that's Siddha. But if the material plane fails you because you're still authorizing what you're doing, and still pleasing, then it doesn't matter. Siddhya, Siddhya, Samabhutva, Samatvam, Yoga Uchite, that's yoga means. You've got to have that Samatvam, Sama. <coughs> Let me pursue this a little bit more. Um, you're talking about how Prabhupada was confronting the Maya bodies. Um, uh, let's explore the subtleties of this a bit, because on the surface, what devotees are thinking in all the different branches, from the Neo Gaudiamat to the Ritviks to the Iskon fanatics, everyone is thinking, I'm not a Mayavadi. I accept Krishna. I accept the personality of Godhead. Uh, the Mayavadis are saying it's all one. Mm -hmm. So we're not Mayavadis. Mm -hmm. so, so Prabhupada was a bit kind of heavy handed with the whole thing because, you know, we accept. Um, but obviously Prabhupada was, was making a much deeper point. Well, first of all, Mayavad means, Vad means conclusion. Maya means conclusion of Maya, but in what context? The Mayavadis say that there's a plane where Radha Krishna is, which is very, very subtle and very high and very advanced, but actual spiritual life is beyond that plane. So they say that plane where Radha and Krishna are enjoying their pastimes is still Maya, but it's very, very high Maya, very, very subtle high Maya. Hmm. But the absolute truth is Vishnu beyond that, and then beyond Vishnu, which is still form, is Brahman. So they have this to Vishnu to Brahman. So that's that's classic Sankaracharya Mayavad. So I will agree with the statement that you just made that if the comebacker is that uh, we're not Mayavadis, it's classic Mayavadis, no, of course not. But what is the essence of Mayavad? That that does need to be confronted. Because this idea that you can minimize Radha and Krishna, which is light, light, light years away beyond even that concept from how fallen this position is, but Radha Krishna position in the Leela pastimes of the spiritual sky, and then Vishnu, Ma Vishnu supposedly being above that, just as Ma Vishnu lying in causal ocean with the pastimes of emanating universes, etc., and then the Brahman being the ultimate, and then you are Brahman. So what is underlying the whole thing of the Mayavad? The essence of Mayavad is you are Brahman. Then if this Radha Krishna is not God, and, Ma, and Mahavishnu, although Radha Krishna is God, but God on that plane, and then Mahavishnu, God on that plane, and then Brahman, the real God, which, by the way, you are Brahman. So you go to this is the real goal. So that essential idea that I am God ultimately, but I'm right now covered by ignorance, that is present. That's present in Sahajism. That's present in human enjoyment. That's present uh, throughout the whole covering. That's the reason we came down. The idea of misusing our independence entered and we acted on it. <coughs> 
we acted on it. So you said it's present in Sahajism, and you also said that Sahajism had, has infiltrated the Christian conscious movement. Big time. Um, maybe you can explain those two things. One, one, how has Sahajism uh, in, uh, infiltrated the Christian conscious movement, and how is Sahajism a form of um, uh, I am God? Okay. Well, I am God, the two psychological divisions of Ahankar are I'm the enjoyer and I'm the doer. So right there, I am God is involved in that. Not I am the servant. Ahankar is not I am the servant. Mm -hmm. Ahankar is I am the enjoyer, I am the doer. One of the two psychological divisions. Now, Sahajias. This, is, this needs to be understood much better than it currently is understood. Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur has stated clearly the Sahajya groups, but when he stated them, they were the classic Sahajyas of the time. So those were the 13 divisions of Sahajyism. So the Sahajyism that's going on now, some of those, owls, bowels, undoubtedly still go on, but Darvesh, for example, with Darvesh. Darvesh, Prabhupada called the hippies Darvesh. Hmm. Now, were the hippies the classic Darvesh? Of course not. They didn't even know about Darvesh. I would say that if you took a hundred hippies arbitrarily any time in the late 60s, early 70s, and said, what's Darvesh? None of them would know. They might say whirling dervish or something, but they don't know what Darvesh is. And there's a very possi good possibility that Darvesh has something to do with whirling dervish too. But whether or not that's the case, Prabhupada said, Darvesh is the hippies. So that means, what were the hippies? Classic Darvesh? Definitely not. But that whatever is the essence of Darvesh came on through mm. and was part of hippie, which Prabhupada called the hippie religion. He called it the hippie religion more than once. Now, what does that mean? We all got a taste when we were part of that hippie a movement and religion. There was some taste coming there. It was like a religion. Mm -hmm. Not completely, but there's parallels. You had the people you worshipped. The point is that the Darvashas were one of the 13 Sahajya groups. And then there were other ones. And all these 13 have certain things in common, but mostly they do not have too much in common, except that they are deviations off of Vaishnavism, deviations off the Vedic teachings. They're not authorized by any of the 20 Dharma Shastras. And they're not Vaishnav. They're a spin-off that's unauthorized, all 13 of them. Mm -hmm. But then there's 13. So that means there's 13 divisions of them. And so I've already spoken and tried to clarify what is the common thread amongst the deviation. But what is the differences then needs to be understood. But rather than going to all at 13, let's apply to what's going on now. Because yeah. that's what's most important. So the I am God concept is certainly present in the Sahajyas. I am the enjoyer. I, I am the doer in this sense. One may say, well, you don't do anything. All right, that's fine. You don't do anything. Perhaps a lot of Sahajyas think like that. I don't do anything. Because that's stated very clearly in the Gita that uh, you can't, in the material world, because of the laws of the material world, the laws, the svabhava, the laws of your own nature, and the laws of the modes of nature, and the laws of how things work, everything is carried on through all these millions of laws. So you think you do, but you never do because you're in a body that's controlled by laws. You put out a desire, and even desire is a subtle form of conditioning. But we don't want to get off the track here. The point is that the I am the doer, I am the enjoyer consciousness is present in all deviation from Vedic literature. All deviation from the Vedic truth, from the Vedic process, is the I am the enjoyer, I am the doer. And the essence of the Vedas, the essence of the Vedas, Vedic process, the Vedic knowledge, the Vedic teachings, the essence is the Vaishnav teachings, the Vaishnav process. Being a bona fide Krishna conscious person, Krishna consciousness is Vaishnav. Vaishnav comes from Vishnu, Vishnu is a form that emanates from Krishna, expands from Krishna. Vaishnav comes from Vishnu. Vishnu is a form that emanates from Krishna, expands from Krishna. So, any deviation has the I am God concept in it. I pointed this out. Mm. So, all these Sahaja groups have that, but they 
appear to be Vaishnavs to the uninitiated, to the persons that don't have good vision. Now, of these 13 groups, now there are differences, which are very important to understand. We're not going to go into all of them. We're just going to go into basically, basically two of them. Mm-hmm. We can touch on a third. The Jatagosani, classic Jatagosani. Are there any classic Jatagosani? There might be some classic Jatagosani Sahajas in India, but in the West, no. Jatagosani means, Jata means the group, or to be born in the family. Either way, Jata applies to what you're part of, your group or your family. Classic Jatagosani means family. But Jata itself is not limited to that. And Gosani means Goswami means sannyas, order. So the Jata Goswami means that you are in the order of sannyas through your family. So that's the classic Jata Goswami. Classic Jata Goswami means that, that you automatically are a genuine sannyas, you're at the sannyas stage automatically due to your family birth. That's a Sahaja group, but they follow. Totally no, because it's Sahaja, but they follow strictly in many ways. Unlike the owls and the bowels, they're very loose. The owls and the bowels and the Darvesh, these are loose groups that don't have any sense control whatsoever or very little. Sense control is not at all important, uh, especially in the area of sex. Whereas the teachings the prophet gave were exact opposites. Prophet confronted that liberal sex, that permissive sex attitude. Prophet confronted it constantly. There's absolutely no question on that. No one would deny that. No one could possibly deny that. No guru that came from India, and I'm using the term here very loosely and generically, because in our mind, Prabhupada is the guru who came from India. But anyone who was considered to be a guru who came from India, none were as hard line as Prabhupada in that confrontational, that you have to give up your identification with the physical body by giving up the enjoyments of the physical body. As long as you're totally absorbed in the enjoyments of the physical body, you are identified with the physical body. Therefore, you will have to keep taking a physical body. And what is the epitome of that Ananda? If you're not getting the Nitya Ananda, if you're not linked with Lord Nityananda's lotus feet by getting the Nitya Ananda, at least some of it, If you're not getting that, then you're going to go to the material ananda, and the material ananda means sexual enjoyment. Everybody knows this. This is not uh, a difficult realization to get. The Jata Goswani, they they have this Goswami energy through the family. So Jata can also mean the group. So... Will the classic Jata Gosani apply to what's going on now in the West? No. But Neo Jata Gosani, it most definitely applies. It most definitely applies. Because of the group, therefore, I am linked with the Sampradaya, because I am linked with whatever the group is saying, whatever the group stands for. There is truth in the group intrinsically. Now, automatic sannyasis, because... They give sannyas. Because somebody in the group has sannyas, he can automatically give sannyas because the group says he's a sannyasi. Therefore, if you join the group, then he becomes sannyasi. This is Neo Jata Gosani. This is very big right now amongst in the Western deviation. And I'm confronting it. And I'm confronting it in the spirit of Prabhupada. And I see Mayavad in it. Your original question was, how can Mayavad be present? We're not doing classic Mayavad? No, of course it's not classic Mayavad. Mm -hmm. But the essence of Mayavad is in it. Because the essence of Mayavad is, I am that Brahman. I am the enjoyer. I am the doer. If somehow or other I've engaged in this bad Leela down here. But really, I am God. That's the essence. But I am God, we aren't God. We, we got some of the qualities of God, and one of his qualities is complete free will to do whatever he wants at any time. And all we've got is a very small smidgen of that. And our small smidgen of that free will and independence is this. It's very, very simple. We can choose to do what he wants or what he doesn't want us to do. We have the choice, 
and he lays out the whole template after that. Well, let's 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 explore that argument a bit because I I'm hearing the comeback that somebody would say. Let's do it. Um, a group that you might call neo uh, um, Jatak Goswami, um, let's say, is one of these new Iskong guru groups. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what they'll say is, what are you talking about? Brahman, I think I'm God. We're better devotees than most devotees. You know, uh, our austerity is following the principles. Uh, we chant, we do this, we do that. Come and see us. We're, we're Paka. Um, you know, they would say, your, um, your criticisms don't apply to us. We're very Krishna conscious. Superficially, yes. And the Smarta Brahmins, the other one of these 13 groups is a smarta, smarta sahaja, smarta brahmins. So they're very strict too. So will I grant that some of the sahajas in the West are strict? I'll grant that. That they do strong superficial sahaja, uh, sadhana? I'll grant that. The issue is guru. Mm. Guru means heavy with knowledge. Guru means minimum. I'm giving minimum now. Gurus are on different planes of realization. But uh, the minimum plane to be guru is an art and a vritti. If you aren't an art and a vritti, you cannot be guru. An art and a vritti is very advanced for one who is not an art and a vritti. But for one who is, who is not an art and a vritti, it's a very advanced state. But there's no guru below that state. Now, guru should be above that state. In other words, an art and a vritti, a starting point, has to be there. Just like if you go into and you lift weights, then you got to, you know, you're not considered to be a weightlifter with significant strength until you can bench press your own weight. But bench pressing your own weight, which is commendable because most humans can't do it, but Bench pressing your own weight is just considered the starting point of that, all right, you're a genuine weightlifter. You can bench press your own weight. There's a lot of people who bench press two times their weight. Uh, they're really up there. So in the same way, guru is meant to actually be Mahabharata. That's the real guru. But guru is allowed for anybody who is Shrotriyam Brahmanishnam, someone who has heard properly, and who is Brahmanishtam, firmly fixed in Brahman. We, we know this stage. We just, we, instead of this stage, we don't call it Brahmanishtam generally. We call it just Nishta, firm faith, which is above a Nartha Nivriti. So if there's a Nartha's present, then there's not Guru present. And. Could you explain what a Nartha's? Well, a Nartha's are practically unlimited, but I'm going to explain some specific ones. But uh, big, you, for example, you could say meat eating is an anartha. In one sense, it is an anartha. Meat eating, intoxication, gambling, illicit sex. You can say these are the four anarthas. You can say uh, this is. You'll hear this propaganda that these are the four anarthas. But anarthas are many, many, much more than that. Those four things: meat eating, intoxication, gambling, illicit sex. Those four things means that if you're free from those, then you're called a human. <laughs> Okay. In other words, you got to get to the human eligibility again. You have to get free, free from those four things. But the anarthas are many. Nam aparad, aparads are anarthas. Nam aparad, deity aparad, Vaishnav aparad, Maha Bhagavad aparad, Gurv aparad. Any kind of offenses against other living entities is aparad, is anartha. Attachments to sense objects of any sorts is anartha. Anarthas are so many. We're not going to undergo a discussion, detailed discussion of all the different anarthas. Material but attachment? Well, if there's material attachment, yes, that's an anartha. What we're going to deal with here is the very specific anartha. Specific anartha. Namely, the anartha of allowing the group to determine who's guru. Mm. You have to trace back the history. That is required. Prabhupada did not come here without a historical format. 
And Prabhupada emphasized it in historical format. Right in the Bhagavad Gita, he emphasized it in the fourth uh, chapter of Gita, right from the gate. The historical format of the disciplic succession of the Guru Parampara in history, going back millions of years, and how the knowledge of Gita came, how the knowledge of Vyasadeva came, how he is linked with that Sampradaya. You do not become Guru by the strength of your group saying, we're appointing you Guru. And you do not become a Mahabhagavat by a rubber stamp. Because the Guru says, uh, I think the group is a saying, I must be a Mahabhagavat, so therefore, although I know I'm still a dog, I'm really a Mahabhagavat because the group says. No commission, no governing body can decide who is Guru. By votes, by vetoes, by any process, it's not done that way. Prabhupada gave what the standard is. So if we walk back through the historical facts, we will see that there are gurus who were unauthorized because they created a new way of becoming gurus that is an anartha. Mm -hmm. So they carried anarthas into their way of being guru. Therefore, by definition, they cannot be guru because guru. if a guru has anarthas, you have nothing. If you say that anybody who's got an artist can still be guru, then anybody can be guru. Then you have nothing. Right. The guru must be totally transcendental to the influence of all sin. What to speak of sin? All anartha. Anything anartha. Artha means uh, positive gain. And anartha means uh, something that's unwanted. So, anartha means that which has no connection to pleasing Krishna, that which is unwanted. Mm. And the sahajism of these groups that follow strictly superficially, superficially they may follow strictly, but even if you look at that with a close analysis, if you have the eyes and knowledge, you'll see that even that's not so strict, and they really aren't too heavily into that anyway. <laughs> but we'll just, we'll go in to say, we'll concede the point. Okay. We'll say that some of them are doing real strict sadhana, and puck a profile, cutting the real good uh, swath down the path of the saffron lane. The, <laughs> the point of the matter is that they've got an arthas right from the gate of how the whole thing started. And if they say, well, that was way back in ancient history, that current still runs through. Because those original ones, some of those are still accepted. Because the ones that came second wave, all were totally subordinate to this first wave. And the ones who came third wave were all subordinate to second and partially to first, etc. The current still runs through. Devotee means honest. What is a Brahmin? Devotee must be a Brahmin. Prabhupada didn't come here to train Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, and Shudras. He came to train Brahmins. Krishna consciousness movement means to create the ideal Brahmin class. Brahmin must be ideal. How do the Brahmins work? Brahmins work through Shamaha, Damaha, Tapaha, Shaucha, Shantir, Shantihi, uh, the most important one, Arjavam, Gana Vigyana Astikyam. Arjavam is what I'm going to talk about right now. Arjavam means honesty, simplicity, straightforward. What you see is what you get. We've lost the thread of that. That was very important in the beginning. We all came because we came in the beginning to Krishna consciousness because the honesty was was right there. Yep. And what was that honesty doing? That honesty was confrontational. Mm -hmm. That honesty was saying, you're off. You got it wrong. You're rationalizing. You're not coming to grips with what death is. You're not seeing this life for what it is. You're not seeing how special and ultra rare the human form is. Human form is so ultra rare. And what is terrifying about misusing it is that once you lose it, it's going to take a long time to get back to it. And you can lose it again. We tend to think, okay, we're up here sitting pretty as humans. Compared to the other energies that are caught in these different bodies here, the humans are very well off. Absolutely no doubt about that. A lot more facility, a lot more ability to get free from pain. Uh, a lot more ability to enjoy, 
a lot more independence, but still ultimately no actual total independence. That's impossible for the Jiva Tattva. But we were confronted in the beginning by just the, the jnana and the honesty. It was confrontational. Remember your original question. The original question was, why can't we just attract? Mm. Why do we have to confront? But we didn't come because we were simply attracted. We had come, we came because we had internally confronted what is going on? Who am I? Why am I being forced to suffer? Why am I forced to die? Why am I forced that I have this attachment to this one and this attachment to another, but I can't stay with any of these people? If you offered uh, people now, if you said, <laughs> okay, do you, do you say there's a lot of pain intrinsically, inherently, in the material world, being a human, do you say there's a lot of pain? Yes, I accept. There's automatically a lot, way more for some, but doesn't matter. For everybody, there's some pain. Okay. Well, let me give you this offer. Uh, you can live eternally as a human with your friends who are grant them that they can live eternally as a human, but the pain must stay. Will you take it? Most would take it. But that's not offered. Dukhalayam ashashvatam. Dukhalayam, a place absorbed with miseries, ashashvatam, and still it's temporary. You can't, there's no, no locus standing. There's no place where you can fix forever. There's no physical body you can fix forever. No relationships you can fix forever. It's not offered. Everything is constantly in flux. Shara bhavaha. Endlessly mutable, constantly changing flux. The point is, we have to use the human opportunity, see how rare it is, we have to get out of the entanglement, which can be done through knowing the art of dying, which can only be done by confrontation, at least in the beginning. First comes the tapasya, the pain, the austerity and the penance, then the bliss. And the vikarmis and the karmis, here in the West, we'll say the Vikarmis, they know this principle. They're doing it anyway. Mm -hmm. They go work for eight, nine hours a day. First they go to work, and then they come home to enjoy, and then they get their mixed happiness, unless they have a major argument. <laughs> so they already know the principle. They're working it, but that's the material. Then they have to get up in the morning, start all over, roll that, ra that rock back up like Sisyphus, mm -hmm. and go to work and get uh, pounded on by the association and by the bosses. Krishna conscious means permanent solution. And permanent solution means to get in contact with Guru. The Guru is heavy with knowledge, and he can tell you how to get out of the problem. But there's no Guru if there's an Artha. And an institutionalized Guru is loaded with an Artha. There's no such thing as an institutionalized Guru. guru well, let me ask you this. Do you think it's better than nothing? I think it's worse. Mm. Yeah, Prabhupada always gave the example that... Uh, the, the German piano master, you know that example, right? All right, he would charge something like 2000 if you came in and you had no knowledge of piano at all. But then he would charge 5000 if he had knowledge of piano. Well, you'd think, knowledge of piano coming in, I should be charged less. No, because he has to unbreak and undo all the wrong habits, all the wrong quote-unquote knowledge. Sure, you got some knowledge in there that he's going to repeat, but you also have some misunderstandings that you think is knowledge. Asat ye re, sat ye kori mani. Thinking something wrong to be right. You go to a bogus guru, you go to a false guru. Then you'll be given some gyan, no doubt. Nobody is going to give straight nations. Who's going to attract by straight nations? That's not going to work. But it'll be mixed with 1% or 2 or 5% again. But it'll be mixed with 1% or 2 or 5% again. And it'll be mixed, which means just like you look at a rug and the threads are very...
thick and easy to discern on the outside threads, but once the rug gets woven more to the inside, the threads become finer and finer, and you can hardly discern. Gray. You could say gray is better than black and white, because there's black in black and white, but gray, there's no black. But gray is worse. Mm -hmm. You look at something that's gray, and it's loaded with really tiny spots of white and black that are so mixed together that you can't even discern. So, uh, the new people, if they're getting anything, they cannot attribute what they're getting to the bogus guru, and they cannot attribute to the group what they're getting either. If they're getting anything, then there's still something maybe coming from books that have not yet been mistranslated enough, or maybe some of the just straight tapes from Prabhupada. So, I don't agree that uh, getting in contact with somebody who has any false teaching spiked in is a, is a good thing. Okay. In other words, you think be, you'd be better off having no um, exposure to Krishna consciousness than to be exposed to an um, unqualified guru group. All right, here's the thing. Let me clarify it even more, more specifically, because what I've been saying seems to be almost a fanatical hard line, but it really isn't, but let me explain it so that you can see it. Alphabet. All right, say that you're at the point where you're digging bread that's pretty much been, you know, gone past its date, that's been thrown into the garbage can. You got no money, so you're, you're eating by digging bread out of the garbage can. If you come then to a, a current situation, which is basically at root deviated, but still follows superficially. A, B, C, D. You're going to get A, B, C, D benefit. A, B, C, D. You're going to get uplifted from that point where you were. Through A, B, C, D knowledge, you come to a point where you're into the alpha, you were below A. Yeah. Now you're going to be at D. A, B, C, D. But, G-H-I, guru, honesty, institution. Once you get the G-H-I, you're going to be off. Mm -hmm. So you get A-B-C-D benefit. But once you get deeper into those threads, you're going to get covered over. And where will that lead you then? Mm -hmm. It'll lead you to rationalized activities that are not actually pleasing to Krishna. Mm -hmm. And with those rationalized activities, where will that lead? That will lead to vikarmic reactions no matter what anybody says. It will lead you, guru, wrong conception of guru. Wrong conception of guru will mean wrong initiation also. Mm. G-H-I, guru, honesty, either institution or initiation. You're going to have wrong concepts about initiation. You're going to have wrong concepts about guru. And therefore, you're going to hit the wall. But you won't think you'll hit the wall. <clears throat> I thought, you know, what you were what we were talking about before about the um, qualified guru Anarta, uh, when you say it, it's it, it's so to me it's so blindingly obvious. But there is such a, a prevalence of well it's it's a combination of deep confusion misconception uh, of, the, of the whole guru issue um, uh, the, 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 you know the, the scientific approach to understanding who's actually a qualified guru is um, it's really not even discussed anymore by any of the groups Ritviks, neo Gaudias. not in their interest to discuss it yeah um, So the question would be, um, is it a little too radical what you're saying? Because after all, if, if, if qualified gurus are such a rarity, how is the whole thing supposed to go on? These are the kind of questions you yeah, get. That's actually a very excellent question for the reason that that's the one they gravitate to, that question right there. You also brought up the word radical. Radical is a word we all know, but we have different conceptions of it. 
Radical comes from a Latin word, radix, R-A-D-I-X, which means root. Mostly we think in terms of a radical as a bomb thrower extremist. Well, during the 60s there were some radicals like that, but radical isn't limited to that. Radical means to get to the root. The Krishna Consciousness Movement is a radical movement. It is the radical movement because it gets to the root of all the issues of human existence. It gets to the root of all the controversies. It gets to the root of the truth of the teaching and the root truth of the teaching has a Sanskrit name. That name is called Siddhanta. So anyone who believes that the Siddhanta must be understood is a radical because he's going to the root. So if someone says, how does the movement go on? My counter question is, have you solved this problem? What's your attrition rate? Does it look very good? Your attrition rate's pretty high. In fact, it's abysmally high. Is the way to spread the movement to quote unquote initiate 50 people have 40 of them fall away, have 10 of them quote-unquote stay, have 7 of the 10 stay on the fringe, and 3 plug in, 2 of the 3 becoming fanatics, and 1 of the 3 becoming some kind of psychophant. Is this the way to spread the Christian consciousness movement? Then what happens? For example, it's quite well known right now that Krishna consciousness is having a hard time in America. Would you agree or not? Yes, it's true. No, no, no new recruits. It's, it's not really a disputed point. It's pretty undisputed that Krishna consciousness is not spreading very well in America. So why is that? Well, let me give one reason that's not too difficult to comprehend. If you do this program of initiating anybody and everybody on a watered-down basis, dumbing the whole thing down, what's going to happen? You're going to get, as I say, 50 people, using this as an arbitrary number, but you could pick any number, you could pick 20, 100, we'll use 50. Ruled by Jupiter, good number. <laughs> all right, you get 50 people, and they're going to all get quote-unquote initiated. They get initiation, but it's not the Bhakti Lot to Beach they're receiving, but they get initiated. Alright, then 40 of them fall away. Attrition rate's high, because why? Because what are they getting? Plus, they're getting burnt, fried, and deep fried. So they fall away with resentment, many of them. Some may fall away and say, oh, I just couldn't do it, but a lot of them fall away with resentment, because a lot of bad things happen to them, and they also realize they were cheated in various ways, they're going to talk to people, and that's going to spread. Yeah, let's take this example. You have 40 that fall away, and let's say 10 of them blame themselves for falling away. That's a reasonable figure, but then 30 don't. And those 30 are going to talk to people, and they're going to say, you know, I was brought in on false pretenses, or whatever. This happened to me, that happened to me. And they're going to say very bad things to at least five people. And those five people are going to say it to at least one or two. And that's going to spread. Not just from the 50, but that's happening all over. And that spread is going to interact. And it's going to keep on going. And all of a sudden, everybody's going to hear that something's grievously wrong with the Krishna consciousness movement. It's going to spread. It's going to be heard by more than one. One, one of these devotees I'm talking about, who's in this category, who briefly affiliated with me, he went to a New Age bookstore in the Bay Area, and as he was checking out the bookstore, some book that he purchased, he was talking to the proprietor behind the counter, and he'd see if he could get some preaching in of some sort, and he mentioned the movement, 
And the guy behind the counter said, isn't that run by demons now? So the spread has come. So radical means to get to the root, not to be a bomb-throwing extremist. That's not, if, if your question was, uh, why be so radical? Well, I'm not, I'm not engaged in radical activities in that sense. I'm not engaged in extreme activities. I'm not engaged in extreme destructive activities. That I'm not engaged in illegal activities. But radical means I am engaged in root, understanding the root of all the controversies, understanding the root of the facts, understanding the root of the historical accuracy, understanding the root of the siddhanta. And it's these things that must be understood. For not just the prayers, 